All right. Good evening. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Grand Rounds. Uh, I think we also have some online presence, and people are going to trickle in as we uh, get it all started. So uh, for today's Grand Rounds, uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting topic. Um, I'm, I mean, it's going to highlight a different aspect of um, electrophysiology uh, other than just uh, only ablating. It's talking about uh, beyond ablations. But before we get into the story, uh, let's do a little bit of the work to get our CME account. So for our CME credit for the session, please text 20386 to the number 888-816-4893. As an SMS message, you can uh, do it now if you want to, or anytime after uh, the session for 12 hours. This whole uh, thing is going to be recorded and be available uh, on the website for you to be able to review. And also for uh, physicians who are uh, desirous of getting their most seen credits, uh, you have to complete the step one. And uh, the list of the questions are on the link that is listed here. You will see that again. Uh, and the room code is future 60, future 60. All right, so you can use that as a link to your MOC. So you have to fill, fill both the step one and step two for getting the credits. All right, so before we get into uh, the topic, I'm uh, really, really thrilled that uh, Dr. Rod Passman, our speaker, has taken time to come here. Uh, Dr. Passman is the Jules J. Rengal Professor at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, Director of Northwestern University Center for Arrhythmia Research, Associate Director of Cardiac Electrophysiology. I learned from his CV that he is very close to the tri-state area. So he did his uh, initial internal medicine from Bronx, uh, New York, and then subsequently had fellowship uh, in electrophysiology and also the fellowship fellowship in cardiology and electrophysiology, both from the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, I also learned that he's got a significant family presence in the tri-state area in New York. He spent time with his father yesterday. So that was great to know that this visit was twofold, not just the Grand Bronx. We are always interested to uh, make sure that people get to do the better side of the visit as well. And when I went through his uh, CV, uh, what a distinguished CV in terms of his persistence to be able to get federally funded. He's uh, not only well known um, for his work in electrophysiology and he has well published, he's, he's well reputed uh, and known in these societies. But I went through his uh, research grants. He has got significant uh, grants from NIH uh, ranging from U grants to R01s, and currently he's uh, he's got this huge grant um, that we are all going to be part of. He's going to tell you about it uh, uh, briefly, and he's got also industry funding. He's got uh, a significant contribution to create the leadership of the future. He continues to mentor. He was the mentor of the year for 2021. And uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Rod, I also enjoyed sitting down with you and talking to you because. Um, uh, Camus, who comes uh, and has been very kind to be able to invite you uh, for us, mentioned that you are very good in one act stand comedy at the uh, at the <laughs> at the fellowship event. So I was trying to find her, but I found you very serious and very articulate, and I was very well able to reflect upon. It's a great delight to be able to. So if you if you ever want to talk to someone really uh, nice and prolific in research. The, here's an example. Without uh, due for the due, uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you for that uh, really kind uh, introduction. It really has been a great day to see old friends and meet uh, some hopefully future colleagues and a great generation of uh, cardiologists coming through the system. So really a great day. I have to tell you though, Truthfully, one of the big highlights for me being here is that, as you mentioned, um, while I've lived in the Midwest now for 25 years, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, raised on Long Island. And what almost excites me the most is that over the next 45 minutes, I can, for once, speak at my normal speed. So I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm going to be talking about um, this concept of pill and pocket anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation. And over the next 45 minutes or so, I hope to convince you that this approach is anything but foolish. But I'm going to tell you now that this is controversial. 
I hope that there's enough time at the end and you'll be angry and yell at me and point to other points of data. And that's really what science and discovery is all about. So we're all in search for the truth. And uh, hopefully I will convince you uh, that anything uh, but foolish is what I'm discussing today. So these are my disclosures. Um, I'm going to start with a really straightforward case. This is a case we've all seen. This is a patient of mine. And I'm showing you this case because if you're like me, you spend most of your day thinking about taking care of patients and most of your energy thinking about taking care of patients. You tend to remember your failures much more than you do your successes. And let me share with you one of my failures. Um, this was a 66-year-old man uh, with a history of hypertension. So his Chad's vascular score was two. He had highly symptomatic paroxysmal AFib. At that time, I had him on an antiarrhythmic drug and anticoagulation. His symptoms completely resolved. And every ECG I did, every monitor that I did, every physical exam that I did for the next three years showed normal sinus rhythm. So at this point, I have two choices. Number one, I could continue him indefinitely on his oral anticoagulation, thereby preventing a stroke should he have recurrent AFib. But in doing so, I expose him to the risk of a drug that he may or may not be benefiting from. The other option is I could essentially stop oral anticoagulation and keep my fingers crossed that the first sign of recurrent AFib isn't a stroke. My decision then was what it would be today. Our guidelines are very clear that we do not make decisions on long-term anticoagulation based on whether or not we have employed a successful quote-unquote rhythm control strategy. We should have no regard for how much AFib someone has. That decision is based solely on the risk of stroke, which today is based on the Chad's Vest scoring system. So that's what we did for Mr. M. We continued him on his anticoagulation, that is, until he came in with his intracranial hemorrhage. Um, this guy worked as a prominent lawyer in town, never spent a day of work again, was wheelchair bound, severely dysphasic and dysarthric. Um, I got called last year at this time that he went into hospice and a few weeks later he died. So the question is, why did I not stop anticoagulation then or would I today routinely on my patients? For one, at least at Northwestern, maybe you do a better job, but I cannot guarantee 100% cure rate for atrial fibrillation, whether it be with drugs, ablation, or even surgery. Number two is a lot of the things that we do to patients, whether it be drugs or ablation, convert a lot of symptomatic AFib into asymptomatic AFib. So patients telling us that they feel better is not sufficient for us to base a clinical decision. Number three, then as is now, there's a debate about whether it's the AFib that causes the stroke or whether the AFib is a marker, and we'll talk about that in a moment. When I saw Mr. M, it was in the Coumadin era. We had no way of rapidly anticoagulating someone with an oral agent, nor did we have a way of determining whether someone slipped back into AFib if they had no symptoms and they were sitting across this room or across the world. There are, however, reasons to consider stopping anticoagulation. Number one, patients come to us hoping that we could cure them of their AFib. And even if we can't cure them of their AFib, perhaps we can reduce the AFib burden below a threshold with which this risk of stroke is actually lower. We recognize that anticoagulation has risks. Anticoagulation clearly has costs from a personal and societal perspective. And I would say number five is really number one. Patients truly do not want to be in a lifetime of oral anticoagulation, particularly when you have shown them that they are in a normal rhythm every time you visit their office. So the current approach to stroke prevention is really a one-size-fits-all model, that we have no regard for how much AFib you have. So someone on the upper right um, who is in atrial fibrillation all the time and have a CHADS vest score of eight or nine is on the same dose of the same anticoagulant for the same period of time as patients on the lower left who have borderline CHADS vest scores and now may have little to even no AFib as a result of cardioversion, lifestyle modification, antiretic drugs, or ablation. So my question is, can we take these patients and treat them differently? Can we take these patients and treat them with a pill-in-pocket approach where we stop their oral anticoagulation, monitor them intensively, and anticoagulate them only for a fixed period of time and only in response to a prolonged episode of AFib? And in doing so, we may effectively prevent strokes while minimizing the exposure to long-term oral anticoagulants. Now, for this to occur, five things need to happen. Number one, I would need to prove to you that atrial fibrillation is in the causal pathway of stroke. Number two is I would need to define how much AFib one needs to have a stroke. Number three is I would need rapid onset oral anticoagulants. We would need technology that allows for long-term non-invasive monitoring of AFib. 
And then lastly, I would need studies to show that this approach is effective and safe. Now, let's start with number one. Now, I was taught when I went to medical school in the late 1800s that AFib was the cause of stroke, right? And if this, some, this was someone's, let's say, implantable monitor, and these black bars represent periods of AFib measured in hours, and this red lightning bolt is the day of stroke, that the risk of stroke waxes and wanes following each episode of AFib. But there's another hypothesis. Right? Some would argue that the risk of stroke remains constant and these episodes of atrial fibrillation are simply a marker. And those that argue this other hypothesis would say that there's a atrial myopathy going on, that these patients with vascular risk factors may have stroke from non-atrial mechanisms, but that patients with vascular risk factors also have an abnormal atrial substrate that can lead to stroke in the presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. And therefore, even if you get rid of the atrial fibrillation and the myopathy remains, the risk of stroke remains. And those that believe this model would show me these three studies. These are three studies, one called TRENDS, one called ASSERT, and one called IMPACT, that enroll patients with pacemakers and defibrillators capable of recording all episodes of AFib. And within these relatively large studies, there were a handful of patients who had strokes, and those patients are represented by those red lines that I drew in. The gray that you see in the background are the periods where we're monitoring their rhythm, and the black that you see are the periods of AFib. And if I could summarize these three studies, again, relatively small numbers of strokes, they would say that in some cases, the AFib and the stroke occurred closely together. In some cases, there was a huge temporal dissociation where the AFib occurred in December and the stroke occurred in May. And lo and behold, there are some cases that had strokes and no AFib at all. And while some may argue that this is evidence of a myopathy, let me take another approach. Right? This may also just be an effect of confounding. These patients have diabetes and hypertension and heart failure, and they're older. And lo and behold, not all strokes are cardioembolic, even when you have atrial fibrillation. So remember, too, that this was done in an era where people were not routinely doing MRIs on patients with implantable devices. So no real effort was made to adjudicate the mechanism of the stroke at the time of these studies. Because when they did, in the ASSERT trial, for example, of nearly 2,600 patients, there were only 51 strokes. Of those patients, the mean age was 78, the mean Chad's VAS score was five, and only five of those strokes were thought to be cardioembolic in nature, and all of them occurred within 30 days of an episode of AFib. So again, why should we be surprised that lo and behold, there are patients who have a pacemaker and have a stroke, and the AFib occurred months before when we don't even know what type of stroke this was, and there are multiple competing risks of stroke. A better way of doing this is really a case crossover approach to ask a very simple question. Why don't we take patients who have implantable devices and find patients who had a stroke and ask what were the odds that they had a prolonged episode of AFib in the month prior to the stroke on their device? And we'll call those the cases. Then in that same individual, a few months before, when they were of similar age with similar risk factors, right, what were the odds that you had a prolonged episode of AFib without a stroke? And we'll call that the control period. If AFib is a marker, right, you would expect it to be equally distributed during the case and control period. If AFib is in the causal pathway, you would expect more AFib in the case period than the control period. Make sense? So that's what we did. We combined two large databases. One is the Optum database that had clinical information on about 11 million people. And we combined that with the Medtronic CareLink database that had device data on nearly 1.4 million people with two and three lead devices. And from this database, we wound up with about 467,000 people, people where we had a lot of information on them. But of those, there were 891 patients who had a clearly documented stroke. We understood their clinical histories, and we had very good data from their devices. And while this 891 number may not blow you away, let me remind you that those three studies I showed you earlier together, which really formed the basis of the argument for the atrial myopathy model only had 160 patients. So remember, there are four scenarios here. Number one is that you had AFib during the case or control period. You had AFib during the case or the control period, or you did not have AFib at all. And the ones that are informative to us are rows B and C. So when we do our calculations, remember an odds ratio of one suggests that AFib is a marker. An odds ratio of greater than one suggests that AFib is in the causal pathway, 
And what we found was an odds ratio of 3.7. Now, what's interesting is when these strokes occur, because what happens is the risk of stroke seems to go up precipitously about fivefold in the first week or so following the onset of the episode of AFib, and then goes back down to some non-zero baseline. Now, what I found most interesting is that the there were these uh, patients in this study who were on anticoagulation, and they're on the right. If you were not on anticoagulation, that temporal association, that odds ratio goes up to nearly eight. If you were on anticoagulation, that odds ratio becomes a non-significant 1.4 suggesting that these are cardioembolic events, right, that occur in response to an episode of AFib and are sensitive to oral anticoagulants. Now, the next thing is how much AFib is too much, right? If we're going to say we're going to restart anticoagulation for a month, right, what is the amount of atrial fibrillation that's going to cause us to pull that trigger? And here too, when I was in medical school, I was taught that it doesn't matter. Right? We knew studies like the SPAF trials going back 20, 30 years, that those with intermittent AFib, what we would call paroxysmal, had the same stroke risk as those with more sustained or persistent forms of atrial fibrillation. And that's what we teach today, that we don't have regard to the amount of atrial fibrillation. But if you look on the right-hand panel, this is data from two trials, one called Averroes and one called Active-A. And these are in the um, aspirin-treated arms of these studies. And what you see here is that even after you control for baseline differences, those with permanent AFib actually have a higher risk of stroke than those with persistent AFib, who have a higher risk of stroke than those with paroxysmal AFib. So actually duration does matter, but how much is too much? Well, for that, we would need to go back to those pacemakers and defibrillators I told you about earlier, which record all episodes of AFib. And this is the first study going back um, nearly 20 years uh, in Italy, where they took patients with dual chamber pacemakers, and they found that only those with 24 hours or more of AFib on their device had an increased risk of stroke. And those with less than 24 hours were as unlikely to have a stroke as patients with no AFib at all. So maybe that magic number is 24 hours. On well, the TRENDS trial, they figured that the median duration of AFib in those that had AFib was about five and a half hours. Those who had more than five and a half hours had about a twofold increased risk of thromboembolic events, suggesting that perhaps five and a half hours is that magic number. Well, in the original CERT trial published in the New England Journal, they took patients with dual chamber pacemakers who had other stroke risk factors and categorized them either as having AFib, right, lasting at least six minutes in duration, found during the first three months of device implantation, and that was one group, and the second group was everyone else. And when you follow those patients for two years or so, you find that those with at least six minutes of an atrial arrhythmia had about a two and a half fold increased risk of stroke, leading many of us to believe that all you need is a single six minute episode. However, even though they drew the line in the sand at six minutes, those same authors, when they looked at that same data, realized that only those with 24 hours or more of AFib actually had an increased risk of stroke. And those with less than 24 hours who is unlikely to have a stroke as patients with no AFib at all. Now, I was actually never one to believe that there was one number for all patients. So um, this is work that I did with um, one of our uh, uh, residents, uh, and then she became a general cardiology fellow and then the EP fellow. Her name is Rachel Kaplan, and she's now at MUSC. And what Rachel did is combine those two databases I showed you. And she plotted the chads vast score in the horizontal axis, and the maximum daily AF duration on the vertical axis. Row one is no AFib. The second row is AFib six minutes to 23.5 hours. And the bottom row is AFib greater than 23.5 hours. And we used as our sort of tipping point, a stroke rate of 1% per year, which some have argued should be the threshold for anticoagulation in the NOAC era. And what we found was that if you have a CHADS VAT score of zero or one, no amount of AFib puts you over that 1% per year threshold. If you have a chads vast score of two, right, and you have episodes of AFib less than 24 hours, again, very low risk of stroke. Same thing with the chads vast score of three or four with no AFib. But if you have a chads vast score of two and have episodes of AFib 24 hours or longer, you cross that 1% per year threshold. And the same is true if you have a chads vast score of three or four 
and have episodes in this six minutes to 23.5 hour range. But I want to make you aware that even though this range was six minutes to 23.5 hours, the median duration here was about 18 hours. So for most patients, it wasn't minutes, it's hours and hours, and it is related to your Chad's best score. <clears throat> and then lastly, if you have a Chad's best score of five or more, you're always at increased risk, even if you don't have AFib, because there are multiple ways to have a stroke and those individuals are at risk. Now, what I'm not saying is that these are cardioembolic strokes. What I'm not saying is that these are strokes that are sensitive to oral anticoagulation because we didn't have that data, but that data is now out there. So I wanna make you aware of two papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the NOAA AFNET trial published in August of 2023. And what NOAA did is it took patients with implantable pacemakers and defibrillators who had at least one or more other risk factors for stroke and who had a atrial high rate episode, most of which were AFib, on their device of at least six minutes in duration. Now, these patients had no history of clinical AFib. This was only device detected AFib. And they randomized them to either get a NOAC or to usual care with a primary outcome of stroke and death. And this study was terminated early because there was a non-significant reduction in the risk of stroke in patients on the NOAC arm, but a significant increase in major bleeds, okay? So leading many to believe that maybe anticoagulating these short episodes does harm and not good. Well, fast forward two weeks ago, right? Another paper came out in the New England Journal, the Artesia trial, which was kind of similar. They took patients with implantable pacemakers, defibrillators, and loop recorders who had at least six minutes to 24 hours of AFib, a child had a score of three or more, and randomized them to either a Pixaban or aspirin with a primary outcome of stroke and systemic embolization. And here, there was a 37% reduction in the primary endpoint, and there was a significant increase in the risk of major bleeds to about twofold. So if you look at these two papers, you would argue that they go in different directions, but not really. Because remember, NOAA was terminated early. It was a 20% or so reduction in that primary endpoint, but it wasn't significant, maybe because of the smaller sample size. And I think that the take home message here is that these shorter episodes of AFib that we call subclinical device detected do carry a risk of stroke. And there probably are some patients who benefit from oral anticoagulation. So in terms of rapid onset oral anticoagulants, we have that, right? All the NOACs or DOACs will anticoagulate you in two to four hours, as opposed to the four or five days that it would take with warfarin. The next issue is the technology for long-term monitoring. And we sort of already alluded to this, right? We could use pacemakers and loop recorders and we can monitor you from home, but there's a problem there, right? Typically you sleep with a bedside by your transponder, which transmits the data in the middle of the night and it goes to the server and it goes to clinic and your team will look at that data and then what? Then you need to call that patient to say, hey, you've had an episode of AFib. Well, if that episode of AFib happened on a Friday, you're not gonna let them know until Monday. And these devices are not patient facing, but probably will be in the not too distant future. Well, I would say that many of us believe, including myself, that the future of AF monitoring will be smartphone based. <clears throat> this is a picture of the Pope's inauguration in the year 2005. If you look really, really closely in the bottom right-hand corner, there's one individual who has a device capable of taking a picture and making a phone call. This is that same scene eight years later, right? There is not one person in the audience who does not have a device capable of taking a picture and making a phone call. So how do we leverage these technologies, right? To detect and manage atrial fibrillation? Well, the cheapest way is that you can actually download an app to your phone that measures something called PPG or photoplasmography. You could hold your finger up to the lamp and you'll get these little squiggly lines and you could use algorithms and AI to distinguish sinus rhythm from atrial fibrillation. The other way is you could buy a device now available in Walgreens or CVS, where you could record a one or six lead ECG onto your phone and have it read right then and there. So finding atrial fibrillation has become pretty easy, but this is a problem as well because this is simply a snapshot in time. We need something that continually monitors the pulse. And for that, we now have these technologies. Right? whether it be Fitbit, Apple, Samsung, these devices now allow 
both for passive monitoring for atrial fibrillation and the ability to record a single lead ECG uh, to confirm the diagnosis. So how does this work? Well, actually, the story is really interesting because um, Apple was interested in designing a device capable of accurately assessing the heart rate during exercise. So they released these heart rate monitors in their Apple Watch, and people started to write letters to Apple saying that the Apple Watch, quote unquote, saved my life because my pulse was fast when I was doing nothing. I went to the doctor and was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. So they realized that we could tell the heart rate, we could tell the heart rhythm. And what this does is the this little light attempts to go on about every two hours. Now I say attempt because if you're moving like I am, it's not going to be able to measure your pulse. But it goes on every two hours and measures a one minute tachygram and assesses whether that one minute tachygram is suggestive of sinus rhythm. And if it is, it'll go into a sleep mode and check again in two hours. Or if it's suggestive of atrial fibrillation, it'll increase the sampling rate to once every 15 minutes. And if five out of six samples suggest atrial fibrillation, it will give the user a warning that they have an irregular heart rhythm. And if you want, you can record an ECG on the watch. Now we were sort of interested in the accuracy of this device because it's really not well understood. So we bought 30 of these watches. We gave them to 30 people who had loop recorders in place or other devices without particular pacing. And we used as our threshold at least an hour of atrial fibrillation. And what we found was that of the 70 episodes of AFib, number one, half occurred when the watch wasn't being worn. But even if you were wearing the watch, the sensitivity per episode was 60%. Because people have repeated episodes, the sensitivity by patient is 73%. And the good news is that in this population, when the device says that you have AFib, it's generally correct. And when it says you don't have AFib, it's also uh, generally correct. But it doesn't need to be like this. So before Apple came out with their watch, this company Cardia made something called Cardia Band, which was this little sensor on the watch band itself, which essentially hijacked an early version of the Apple Watch and turned on that green light whenever it wanted to. And what we did is we gave these watches to individuals with a history of AFib who had devices implanted. And instead of having that green light to turn on every two hours, right, we turn that green light on every five seconds. And we used a convolutional neural network to take that data and to make a continuous wearable device. So here's a patient going into AFib. You could see heart rate variability increase. You could see the heart rate increase. Here's an ECG done by touching your thumb on the uh, sensor on the watch, clearly showing AFib. A few hours later, Back in a normal rhythm, heart rate variability reduced, sinus rhythm on the ECG. And you could tell AF burden because you could tell the percent of time spent in AFib and when they're not wearing their watch at all, right? No heart rate and no activity on the green. And when we gave these watches to patients with implantable monitors in place, right? This was a study that we did in 24 patients. And one of my fellows, Jeremy Wasselhoff, I locked him in a room with 31,000 hours of simultaneous data from the watch and the loop recorder. And we didn't let him come out. And when he did come out, um, what he found was that the sensitivity of this you know, $300 smartwatch for picking up episodes of AFib that were an hour longer was now 97%. And the correlation between the AFib on your several thousand dollar implantable device and your several hundred dollar watch was nearly perfect. And here's a 14 hour episode of AFib on a loop recorder Here's that same 14-hour episode of AFib on your wearable device. So the last thing we need to do is we need studies to show that this approach is effective and safe. And here we've done two pilot studies. On the left is called React.com. On the right is called Tactic AF. And React.com used remote monitoring of implantable devices to basically go on and off anticoagulation. We had a study coordinator um, who would monitor this data daily, call people on weekends and holidays, and essentially tell them to restart their anticoagulation for one month in response to an episode of AFib, uh, at least an hour in duration. On the right is a tactic AF trial where we use pacemakers and defibrillators. And because these episodes have a lead in the atrium, they can detect more accurately even shorter episodes of AFib. So this was done after the um, ASSERT trial and we put as our threshold any episode of AFib six minutes or longer. 
So these were two pilot studies. They were single arm trials that together enrolled 96 patients with 112 patient years of follow-up. In react.com, we reduced the time on oral anticoagulation by 94%. In tactic AF, we reduced that time by 75% with no strokes in either study. We're suggesting that this approach is feasible. What we don't know is, is it safe? And how do you extend this to the tens of millions of people around the world who may benefit, but certainly where the use of an implantable device is just not going to be scalable because of the cost and infrastructure needed to deal with that information? Well, if we argue that AFib and stroke are heavily related, if we believe that hours of atrial fibrillation are needed to have a stroke, if we have rapid onset direct or novel oral anticoagulants, and if this approach is feasible with implantable devices, and we can have AF sensing wearable devices, can we envision a scenario where a patient who would otherwise be on anticoagulation 365 days a year would stop their oral anticoagulants, be monitored by their watch, be alerted when they had a recurrence of atrial fibrillation, be told to restart their oral anticoagulant and take it for 30 consecutive days, and then stop? So a patient who has an episode of AFib every 29 days is never going to get off oral anticoagulation. A patient who has one episode of AFib a year would only need to be on their oral anticoagulation one month out of the year. So we took that data from the pilot study and we applied for this UG3, UH3 clinical trial, which ultimately got funded by the NIH. And the study is called REACT-AF, stands for Rhythm Evaluation for Anticoagulation Therapy for AFib. And essentially, this is a one-to-one -one randomized trial that will compare the standard of care of chronic direct therapy with smartwatch-guided targeted direct therapy. The primary endpoint is a non-inferiority endpoint for combination of ischemic stroke, arterial embolism, and all-cause mortality. And the secondary endpoint is superiority for major bleeds. The study will enroll up to 5,350 patients at 80 U.S. sites, I'm happy to say, including your site. The follow-up will be three to five years. Um, the study is funded by the NIH and enrollment began in July. Essentially, patients who meet inclusion and exclusion, regardless of what your arm you're randomized to, to, will remain on anticoagulation for a month. Why? Because we don't know whether they had AFib the day prior to randomization. And then at the end of the month, those in the control arm will continue on their DOAC. Those in the watch arm will stop their all anticoagulants the watch will alert them for a prolonged episode of AFib more than an hour. And again, they will take their oral anticoagulants for 30 days and then stop. So I do want to sort of touch upon some of the key inclusion criteria. We're focused in on a lower risk population, right? CHASVAS score one to four, no prior stroke or TIA. The patients should be on a DOAC already. So we're not randomizing them to DOAC or watch, right? They have a 50-50 chance of having their anticoagulants stop. And then these patients need to be willing and able to comply with the protocol, which means that even though we're giving the intervention arm a customized algorithm Apple Watch, they need to own an Apple phone that's compatible with that watch, be willing to wear that watch around 14 hours a day, and be expected to be within cell phone range at least 80% of the time. Key exclusion, if patients have an implantable device that's going to be pacing them or even a loop recorder, they're not good for the study. Anyone who's had um, more than an hour of AFib on a, a patch that they've worn for a few days, not good. Patients with frequent ectopy could fool the algorithm on the watch that so they're excluded. And those with atrial flutter can look like a regular rhythm to the watch. So if not been ablated, they're excluded as well. One thing I want to emphasize is that everyone in this trial will have a smartphone, which means that all the follow-up is done remotely. The only time we need to see that patient is at the time of enrollment, right? So we are going to get patient-reported surveys. We're going to use geofencing, which can tell us when you've been in a healthcare facility for more than 14 hours. We can then get that data and get your medical records. And then we're going to do some targeted uh, chart review in high-risk individuals. <clears throat> the other cool thing about the study is that we've designed our own apps and that when you get the alert, that you have had an episode of atrial fibrillation, you will need to respond that you've acknowledged that alert. If you do not, you will get push notifications, you will get SMS texts, you will get robo 
calls, and then you'll get an in-person call saying, hey, you're in AFib, you haven't acknowledged it, and you need to start on your novel oral anticoagulant. Now, the other thing that's really cool is that we had to design our own watch complication. What is a watch complication, you may ask? Well, the history is interesting because in the early days of watch building, anything on the watch beyond those hands that told time were complicated to build. So to this day, anything on your watch beyond the feature that tells time is considered a watch complication. So we've designed our own watch complications for React AF. You'll have this watch face that will say you're in the study. If you've had an episode of AFib, it'll change color. It will tell you to take your anticoagulant and a little clock will start to count down the number of days that you need to take it and then stop. It'll also, we're working on this feature where it'll go into your calendar and you can see what days you need to take it and what days you need to stop. And there might be times where you have no data, there's no internet down and that too would give you a warning to say, we don't know what's going on, we can't follow you, and you should restart your anticoagulation. So my talk began with the fact that this might be fact, fiction, or foolish. So why may this approach be foolish? Well, I've argued that there's a temporal association between AFib and stroke, but others have argued the opposite. Right? What happens if the AFib isn't the cause and these patients just have a myopathy? We have decided to restart anticoagulation for an hour or more of AFib. Why an hour? Well, that's probably a short time, but if patients don't wear their watch in the middle of the night and they go into AFib while asleep, that actually may be a much longer episode of AFib that they're then alerted to when they put the watch on. We're also giving a month of anticoagulation in response to that episode. Many of us believe that maybe a three-hour episode doesn't need a month of anticoagulation, but that's kind of the current standard of care following things like cardioversion. And then, of course, there are limitations of the technology. Patients may not wear their watch all the time. You need to charge the watch. The watch can break. There are all of these issues that we have to deal with. And then, of course, the digital divide. Right? People have argued that digital health trials are going to marginalize people who don't have access to this technology. And I would argue that's probably not the case. Because if you look at smartphone ownership in the United States, and this goes back to 2020, it's now about 85% of the U.S. population owns a smartphone, right? Regardless of socioeconomic status. So I'm sure many of you have older members of the family. You can't get by without a smartphone. It's, it's pretty hard to manage. What I will say, however, is that the kind of smartphone you own is dependent on socioeconomic status. This is a map of my city. This black area that you see is Lake Michigan. <laughs> the Evanston campus of Northwestern is up here. This is Loyola. Northwestern Medicine is here. University of Chicago is here. These red dots represent iPhone owners. These green dots represent Android owners. And if I overlay an income map, right, those areas with the highest income are most likely to be iPhone owners. So are we selecting for a study of a higher socioeconomic status by requiring iPhone ownership? And I would say, unfortunately, yes. But um, as we were talking about at lunch today, uh, it's really not an easy problem to solve because giving people a phone means giving people a, a data plan as well. And this is a national trial. And you can imagine how complicated that would get if we had to start buying data plans and managing that sort of thing. So I would say those are barriers. But what is foolish is simply continuing to practice medicine the way we're doing it now. On the left is a figure showing the use of oral anticoagulants over the last decade or so. And as you can see, the number of people taking warfarin has precipitously declined appropriately. The number of people taking DOAX has precipitously increased appropriately. But the actual uptake of oral anticoagulation in general is still about 70% of patients who should be taking it, right? Barely budged. What's also notable is that even when we prescribe these drugs, these are discontinuation rates in 45,000 people the green is warfarin, the blue is apixaban, and you can see the discontinuation rates at about two years is about 50%, right? even on the novel oral anticoagulants. These are hard medications to take. They may be hard medications to pay for. And imagine these patients also have hypertension and diabetes, and why are they taking a blood thinner when they don't have atrial fibrillation anymore, at least in their minds?
I think what's foolish is blindly stopping oral anticoagulation. There's a dirty secret in the EP world, and this is going on a lot. This is from the Mayo Clinic. And the green patients are those at high risk of stroke. The red are considered low risk of stroke. And as you can see, uh, at the end of a year, even those patients post-ablation who are considered high risk of stroke, only 37.5% of them remain on oral anticoagulation. And when you stop oral anticoagulation, post-ablation on those with a chas score of two or more, the risk of stroke goes up two and a half. That's what we're doing now. I think what makes no sense is treating patients alike when they're not alike. These are two patients of mine, both 68-year-old females, both with a history of AFib, both with a history of hypertension. The patient on the left has a loop recorder, has no treatment for AFib, daily episodes of AFib going on for hours. The patient on the right had an ablation done and has not one minute of AFib. Yet under the current standard of care, both of these patients are treated equally with a lifetime of oral anticoagulation. So the implications of this trial, I think, are numerous. Number one, I think we're going to address this issue about whether AFib is the cause or a marker. Because if patients have cardioembolic appearing strokes with no atrial fibrillation on their wearable device, right, but a history of AFib, that would suggest that perhaps it is a marker. I think a positive trial would allow us to reduce the time on oral anticoagulation, and in doing so, reduce bleeding, reduce costs, and improve the quality of life. And then lastly, we could change the indications for why we recommend a rhythm control strategy, moving it away from simply improving symptoms and towards a goal of limiting or eliminating the need for lifetime oral anticoagulation. Now, I will tell you that we've had several uh, key partners that I want to shout out here. Northwestern for this trial is the uh, clinical coordinating center with the help of Stanford. Johns Hopkins is a data coordinating center uh, and UC San Francisco has provided a lot of the technical support. <clears throat> and while this trial is funded by NHLBI, there is this consortium called the Trial Innovation Network that I would really urge you. It's a consortium of like 65 academic centers and they take in clinical trials and help you sort of get them funded and uh, you're uh, part of it. And if you're interested in a clinical trial, the Trial Innovation Network is key. The American Heart Association um, has worked hard with us and through uh, its contacts with Apple. And uh, Apple has provided all of the watches and a lot of the uh, technical support for this trial. I want to make clear to you that what I'm suggesting actually is not new. This is a comic strip from 1960. And on the left, it says an instrumented suit measuring heart rate, blood pressure, breathing and temperature will soon make a checkup in one minute. Diagnoses have already been made from measurements which were transmitted automatically to doctors thousands of miles away. And computers too have helped in the diagnosis. This is January of 1960. But we as a medical profession, I think have trouble adopting these technologies and particularly allowing these technologies to afford patient autonomy. This is a review of a book in JAMA from 1962. The book was Computers and Common Sense, The Myth of Thinking Machines. And it says all physicians who are paying taxes should read this book to become acquainted with the possibilities of automatic warfare, automatic economics, automatic diagnoses, and automatic therapy. Now, I'll finish with this quote from the New York Times, because I think it applies to what I'm doing. It says the notion of allowing patients to test themselves and treat themselves is outlandish to most doctors. Let me remind you, this was not written in the year 2023 in response to what I am suggesting. This was actually written 100 years ago when this medication came out. So I left plenty of time for questions, and I really want to thank you very, very much for your attention. I'll just uh, session for we like to the I think that might be Thanks, Brad, for the talk. Um, maybe I'll ask one question based on the slide that you showed. Uh, you didn't know what you from the mail. I think that's really the 
follow instructions to then say, well, the one or two months a year I might actually need it, maybe like. I think it's hard to be, you know, I don't about you, but like, you know, when I'm putting an antibiotic for like a something and they say to take it for like 14 days, when I feel better three days, I'm out of there. So I think it's really hard to be compliant with a medication over your lifetime. And I think if I told you that your risk of stroke was 500% in the next 30 days, you would take that medication, right? Stroke is the most feared thing. Most of us would rather die than survive, you know, an AFib related stroke. So I do think the compliance um, would be pretty good. And I think compliance with wearing a device that also you know, allows you to read your texts and answer your email uh, and monitors your atrial fibrillation makes it simple. I think we need to be cognizant of what we're asking of people. I think it would be difficult you know, to wear a separate device that would only do this, but people do that with their diabetes, right? And I think that um, you know, compliance for a brief period is much easier, particularly if we show that that, and as we believe, is the, is the period of heightened risk. So I think it makes sense to treat periods of risk and not you know, patients purely based on risk factors, which we were all agreed, you know, is really are not well delineated by the Chad's VAT score, right? It's, it's basically a flip of a coin, and yet that is the, the, the law of the land, so to speak. One of the things that has drawn me to the field of PPE, and I'm sure everything is it's a very dynamic, you know, um, several years in the upcoming five years will really be in the crunch of one great. You know, radio frequency ablation has kind of been for all time ablation. Uh, but even with our ablation, we have to move all time. That efficacy is um, certain pre specified time points, which is often 30 seconds, and it usually takes more than that. Assumption being that if you have a recurrence, the treatment didn't work, that you may be at risk for further sequelae down the road. Now that wearables are going to be. Uh, Adopted, perhaps you would be looking at a burden, not just a simple, you know, 35 cents. Maybe as you lose sleep, um, your risk for some of the bad things of having a different stroke are really not such a binary response to just that 35 cents. So I think we've done ourselves a tremendous disservice by using, you know, 31 seconds as a failure of AFib ablation, right? You have someone who's been in AFib for two years and you do an ablation and they have a single 35 second episode on a device and you would call that a failure. And my guess is a patient would be really happy. So I think that looking at burden reduction is the way to go. You know, Apple watches can give you AF burden now. So the data on AFib ablation is if you look at time to recurrence, the success rate is probably 55%. If you look at reduction, it's 99%. And that's really what patients care about. They don't care about a 31 second episode. They want to know where I was and, and, and how I am now. So I do think I'm, uh, I'd like to see um, companies start to look at burden reduction. The problem is that no one wants to go first, right? Because the FDA has sort of set the bar for time to recurrence. But I do agree with you that we should be monitoring patients beforehand and after um, because I think it's important not only in the way they feel, but clearly there's a threshold with burden reduction in an LV function recovery, right? Uh, maybe in stroke risk, maybe in dementia, and figuring out how much you need to get the AFib down, I think is going to be important. And relief of symptoms is really only one of the goals that most of us think are worth pursuing when you're dealing with a patient in AFib. I just had a uh, basic question, obviously. Um, my maybe there is a Okay. 
time there as well. That underlying value still persists. How would it withdraw? Well, I agree, and we're, and, and I, I think we're going to answer that question because um, if it's a myopathy, right, that persists even when the AFib is gone, then we're going to see high stroke rates, um, and I don't think we're going to see that because um, I mean, at least in the ablation world, the risk of stroke following ablation now those are select patients is very very low, and because typically with the burden tends to be low, so I think um, if 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 it is an underlying myopathy, and and by the way. There is more and more evidence too that we can reverse this myopathy by keeping people in sinus rhythm, right? The we could shrink the atrium um, and um, you know reverse whatever processes led to it in the first place. But this study will answer that question. I don't see another way of doing it. Is there a risk of stopping anticoagulation? Are there going to be some patients who have poor LA flow and left atrial appendage flow even in sinus rhythm? Probably. Now we're not looking at, and and I, I think it would be good to look at you know, get echoes and look at LA function, look at strain and all that. But we just don't have the money to, to acquire that. But that, I think that would be useful because my guess is that if you had someone who had a big left atrium and poor flow, even in sinus rhythm, right, that may be someone who you're not so comfortable stopping it. And they're going to be patients like that who get into the interventional. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Right. We did not. Well, if it's undiagnosed, I mean, or you said undiagnosed, right? So, <laughs> right. All I would say is if it's undiagnosed, we, we're not. My hope is that those patients are equally distributed in both arms. But right, if those patients, and if they had amyloid, then you would not want to stop anticoagulation in that patient. So we may want to add that as an exclusion criteria, actually, just as we have HCM as an exclusion because of the risk of stroke. There's no equipoise there. I Yeah, I mean, there's there's other scores as atria and 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 transvas doesn't include like renal disease, which we know is a factor. You know, we're pretty simple people, electrophysiologists. We can't really remember anything longer than transvas, so it gets complicated. But um, right, it's it's not good, and I think what's missing is you know some of the things are all the imaging that we have. You know, the the C statistic on transvas is is like 0.6. It's a little better than a flip of a coin, and yet you know we do our best, and even with that. And maybe that's why we don't we don't anticoagulate patients as much as they should be, because maybe we don't really believe that this is the best way. And, you know, I have patients who are in you know, chronic AFib or 64 with a CHADS VAT score with no other risk factors, but I anticoagulate them because they worry me and nothing's going to magically happen when they turn 65 or 75. So I do think that um, the problem with, you know, including some imaging is that it then becomes more difficult to implement, you know, Every place else, right? So, where's that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure there are biomarkers. There are lots of ways that we could do a better job, but where to, how to find that sweet spot, you know, that's applicable around the world is, is a challenge. Yes. I think this could be. Yeah. Directly, uh, name of the... Oh, the, the, within three months of, of, of randomization. So you could have had a history of longstanding persistent day fib. We just want to make sure that the rhythm, either on your own or the rhythm control intervention, has been successful. 
So you can't have more than an hour of AFib on a monitor done within three months of randomization. Right, you could have had a high AF burden. You can't have one now, right? Because you're not going to be a good candidate for this if you're an AFib every day, 50% of the time. We just don't want you to want you in the trial. So this is for patients like we see all the time. You're on a drug, you were cardio, you know, you were found to be an AFib on a routine exam, cardioverted two years ago. It's probably going to come back, but it hasn't yet. So what do you do with those people? But we want to distill out those patients who are having a lot of AFib that they don't know about because they're not going to be good for this approach. Behind you. You know, use it and put it off and on. I'm afraid to make a sound talk about the patient's medicine on the pocket. Yeah, so all great questions. Um, I'll do them in reverse order since I'm not sure if I I'll remember that. But so definitely this would be great for someone who does like pill and pocket flecainide, right, to, to do this. But I do tell my patients to come into the hospital the first time because I've seen some like long post-conversion pauses and things like that, less likely EVT. But yeah, that would be a great situation. We actually program this that you don't get alerted in the middle of the night. So if you're wearing the watch, um, we hope that the alarm goes off at like 8 a.m. because we don't want people waking up at two o'clock in the morning and flipping out that they need to start their antipagogy. And and I thought you were going to ask, what is it they don't wear it in the middle of the night? And that's true. We're going to miss these relatively, you know, I mean, it's multi-hour episodes in some cases that don't, you know, that the begin and end when you're sleeping. And that's the reality until we have technologies that are, you know, are easily uh, uh, worn for days on end without charging. Um, that's going to be a limitation. And we can't really, I mean, we thought about, well, maybe we'll give you two watches, you know, or the truth is that these watches will easily last 24 hours and charge an hour or so. So you could wear it all night, wake up in the morning while you're eating breakfast, charge it, and, and that's it. And then your first question was really a great one. Now, we don't know whether it's worse you know, whether like you could have 10% burden and you get there by having, you know, uh, whatever, you know, uh, two hours of AFib a day. And I get there by having, you know, uh, whatever, five days of AFib once a year. The, the percent AFib is the same. So there's this concept of, of density, right? Is it worse to have it all congregated in one period or dispersed throughout the day or the year? And we don't know the answer to that. I think that um, right now we focus on duration because it's the most easy to measure. But there are studies like M-STOPs that said that these are wearable devices. Only those patients who had like an 11 percent burden were at increased risk of stroke, and those with less. But that's like in one snapshot in time. So I think that you know this is very dynamic. And we were talking about earlier this Artesia study that, like, even if you said, okay, if you have a pacemaker and you had 10 hours of AFib, and I don't believe that that's enough. Well, in Artesia. I think you know 20, 25% of these patients cross that line in 24 hours. You know, this is a progressive disease. So even if you say I'm not going to anticoagulate you today for that 12 hour episode, you would need to watch that person closely because 12 hours becomes 18, becomes 24, where we all agree your threshold has been reached. So we're sort of grappling with this because AFib used to be a dichotomous variable. Either you have it or you don't. And now our understanding is how much you have, how it's distributed, all those sorts of things are important. And we're just beginning to integrate that into care, I think. Yeah. Well, you know, um, you know, our study is for patients who um, are um, good candidates for and for DOAC. And I would say watchmen is for patients who are not good candidates. Obviously, there's a lot of indication creep. You know, I think it's about options. There are going to be some patients where continuous DOAC is a good choice. 
Some patients, Watchman is going to be a good choice. And when these factor 11 drugs come out that are going to be maybe safer, you know, but maybe more expensive, maybe they're going to be good for patients who may be at high bleed risk. And I'm arguing maybe there are patients who don't need anything, at least don't need anything for long periods of time. So, you know, we've had sort of a one, you know, a menu with one item on it for a long time. And what I'd like to do is sort of personalize it to say, you know, you're good for this option and you're good for that option. So, um, it, you know, when I think about who's going to cut the brakes on my car, I think it's going to be the NOAC patient, uh, companies first, the Watchman company second. Um, we had uh, one question. And there were two more answers. That's a great question. Um, well, because there are these patients who are on anticoagulation with a CHADS vascular one. I mean, those patients, they're not at zero risk of stroke. It's that the risk of long-term anticoagulation is greater than the risk of stroke it's felt. But maybe a pill in pocket is great for CHADS vascular one, right? To cover them, we've all had CHADS vascular zeros and ones that have strokes. So maybe covering them during that high risk period and then they're sort of those soft ones, right? Those 64 year olds with hypertension. They may be one today, but in a month when they have their birthday, they become a two. So that's why we're we're including them. And then there's a whole female gender thing, right? Which is not a risk factor, it's a risk modifier. And um, we didn't really, you know, I mean, I, I guess in theory you could be, well, you, you cannot be female with a Chad's vest score of one, right? It's either zero or two. So I don't know how we're dealing with that, but um, that's why we chose one. How you highlighted with the red and green lines in the Christmas before? Like, you know, Fitz Packard score is yes. one of the features. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is a big issue because it's not clear or there's concern about the ability of that light or those lights to detect pulse across all skin tones by this Fitzpatrick score. Um, Apple is convinced internally with their own data that these devices function across the spectrum, but we are collecting data on Fitzpatrick scores and seeing if there's issues with that. Um, I think that, um, you know, we're, we're the, the other challenge we have, I must say, is that, you know, there's this, I would say, myth, though supported by some data, that, that underrepresented minorities have less AFib than whites, which I don't actually believe. I think it's a, a lack of access. But certainly what we know is that um, underrepresented minorities are less likely to be on anticoagulation in general, less likely to be put on DOEX specifically, less likely to get rhythm control, and less likely to get ablation. So it's not just the iPhone ownership. It's that maybe uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have challenges because of those other things, um, getting uh, those individuals into this trial. And I think that when we do digital health trials, we just want to make sure that we're not widening the chasm in healthcare, right? We want to be narrowing and take advantage of the fact that people own these technologies. So it's something we are working very hard on, but there are some major barriers. Yes. So, And now we say aspirin is nothing. It's uh, you know, a psychological disadvantage. So um, now we don't have dons, right? So what have you? There are really not any anticoagulations. Yeah. Well, I mean, because they're, you know, the I should tell you that the number of patients from which like CHADS-2 and chads has derived is really small. It's a few hundred patients. So there are very, very few patients in the zero one who've had strokes. But when you extrapolate that to the six or seven million people in the United States that have AFib, we've all seen zeros and ones come in with strokes. So you're right, aspirin has fallen off. The risk of stroke is low. And, and the risk of stroke is so low that, again, chronic anticoagulation does not appear justified. But I think pill and pocket would be great for those patients. I should also tell you that in one trial, you know, in the Averroes trial, the risk of bleeds on aspirin was the same as it was on Eliquis. So why would you give someone a drug that's ineffective and carries a similar bleed risk when we have a drug that's effective? Now, I don't know if I completely believe that because it's not been borne out in all studies, but um, uh, 
I think that in the age of more effective and safer anticoagulants, that the threshold for anticoagulation should drop as well. So um, I don't really, I struggle with, you know, I see 35 year olds with like persistent AFib. And I think those patients clearly have some myopathy going on. There's something wrong with their atrium. And we know in some of those instances, anticoagulation may be the right thing. So I think the Chad's Vasque is sort of a, a stepping stone to a discussion, but I ignore it in both directions, you know, a, a lot, because I think that there are factors that aren't included in the score. And that there are some patients, again, you know, if you have a Chad's Vasque score of through two or three, and you've had, well, certainly if you had, you know, one two-hour episode of AFib in the setting of a URI, you know, two years ago, and we've monitored you and nothing else has turned up, um, I don't really care, you know, what, what the Chad's Vasque score says. I don't think it takes into account, you know, uh, frequency, duration, burden, all those things that we're saying are relevant. But I, Yeah, I, I that that question has kept me awake at night because it makes absolutely no sense. And I would just say that there are there are errors of omission and very errors of commission. Right? If you come in uh, and you know we and you say you've been in AFib for twelve hours and we call you virtue, uh, you know, and and uh, you know, or, or if you go in and out of AFib and we say your Chad's best score is one and we didn't call you virtue, you did it on your own and you had a stroke, we would say too bad. If we do it, right, and you have a stroke, we would say we did something really bad. Same thing, electrical cardioversion is probably no different from spontaneous or you know chemical cardioversion in terms of stroke risk. And I should also tell you, by the way, when patients come in and say, I've been in AFib for less than 48 hours, how do we know, right? I mean, they felt it for less than 48 hours, but often they've been in it maybe longer. It's like the shortness of breath that finally affects them. So I am very strict. I mean, I, I need like, I say, let me have, let me have your Apple watch. Let me see what your heart rate was. I see exactly when it went up. And I think the 48 hour rule kind of implicitly suggests that you need 48 hours of AFib for a clock to form, right? And that's been the rule for decades. So I think there is inherent in the guidelines some sense of how much AFib is too much. But I think that, um, I, and, and I should also say, I think a common mistake that people make is um, when people come into clinic and they have a chance of a score of zero, and they're in persistent AFib, they say, well, your chest risk score is zero, you don't need anticoagulation. They're like, no, 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 we're going to cardiovert that patient. And that patient needs to be on anticoagulation for the cardioversion. And I think I see that a lot. And I'm always like frustrated that ugh, they only started it three weeks ago when they saw their you know, general cardiologist. We wouldn't be here today talking about a TE or another month from now. So there's a lot of, um, to, I think to summarize, there's a lot of things that don't make sense when it comes to AFib. And you pointed out a, a great one, the 48-hour rule doesn't make sense because all these patients, by the way, with paroxysmal AFib, who've never had an episode longer than six hours, why is that a lifetime of anticoagulation? I don't know. Yeah, well, po yeah, post op AFib. They had an episode of AFib. I didn't see them when they're in the hospital after surgery last year. I'm like, what well, they um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've always thought sort of, and, and it depends what kind of surgery, you know, if you had AFib after like foot surgery, you've had AFib all along. We just yeah. recognized it. But, yeah. But um, that I think is, is a, it's a stress test of the electrical system. So I think those patients are clearly at high risk down the road and need monitoring, but don't need a lifetime of anticoagulation because many of those will be one and done, but many of those won't. So I keep a close eye on those people. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, people like have been on it for years. No one stopped it. Yeah. So let me understand the first question, though. So you're saying, are there studies that looked at, like, what's the rate of thrum of, of left atrial appendage clot in someone with 24 hours of AFib? So that's been done, and it's really small. It's like, you know, under 1%. But I would argue, how do you know it's really 24 hours? 
I think a lot of those patients are in it longer than anyone realizes. And the stroke risk isn't zero, even when you do that 48 hour rule. So, you know, I think that there are some some cases. Um, and, and to your point about the myopathy, I think too, if there is a temporal dissociation, is it possible that, uh, you know, you have an episode of AFib in December, a blood clot begins to form, you convert, and that blood clot, because it's there, begins to, you know, grow and propagate and then embolize even weeks or months later. And if we jumped on you and anticoagulated you within hours of that episode, could we prevent that thrombi from even beginning to form and then propagate and, and uploading the embolize? Well, the teaching is 90%. So you're always going to have some, right? I mean, and, and that's one of the arguments in this LAUS-3 trial, right? Which the surgical trial of ligating the left atrial appendage and the patients who did best had that done and remained on anticoagulation because they are always going to be that 10% that doesn't come from it. That's it. That was uh, amazing. Uh, so, um, all the same back, and there are certain people over to uh, doing the trial. And I think uh, there's a fantastic opportunity. Also, uh, maybe parallel studies. And yeah, we're going to have a wealth of data. So, we're open to, to ancillary studies of all sorts. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, picture. Picture. You can take one together. We'll take one together. Okay. Yeah, we'll take one all together. Okay, one all together. Okay. Okay. I thought the TV. Well, yeah, I don't know. away. Okay. 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 Okay.